Can you all hear me okay? Okay, that's good. If I stay here, maybe we won't get the feedback. Karen, thank you. Uh, thanks for the Hagen Ranch Library. I've had the pleasure of speaking at this library many times over the years for various books of mine. Also, we brought Book, C Book TV and C-SPAN here before. Also, thanks to Book TV and C-SPAN for covering this. I've had the pleasure of doing a few dozen programs with either Book TV, C-SPAN, or American History TV, and I'm a, how many fans of C-SPAN do we have in the audience? Okay, everyone, right, me too, right, I love it. So thank you, and thank you to all of you for coming out uh, on a beautiful day here in Palm Beach County. Uh, when you hear that you're giving a lecture, or you announce that you're giving a talk on the War of 1812, you worry if anyone will show up. <laughs> except those needing sleep, right? So Palm Beach County is filled with more historians per capita, right, than any other place. Thank you, I can't believe we have such a, a wonderful uh, and large audience. Hopefully at the end of the remarks, you'll learn something about the War of 1812, because my joke, my punchline has always been most Americans don't even know when the war started, right? <laughs> no one knows anything about it. And hopefully uh, you'll share some of my views that the War of 1812, in my opinion, was one of the most intriguing wars in American history, if not the most intriguing. It was also the, in the year 1814. I've always said that the year 1814 was possibly the most important year in American history. So I'm gonna to try to make an argument for that today. All right, at the conclusion of my remarks, if we have time, I'll take questions. And then after we finish taping for Book TV, I'll turn that mic off and uh, I'll be happy to stay and take additional questions on whatever you want to talk about. All righty? All right. The War of 1812. What a bizarre affair. It's a war that's named for one year, but was fought for two and a half years. We don't call World War II the War of 1941. <laughs> we don't call the Civil War the War of 1861, but we call it the War of 1812. Folks that supported it and feel that it was a positive thing call it America's Second War for Independence. And I think it was that. Its detractors call it an unnecessary war. And I think it was utterly and completely unnecessary. And thankfully, we haven't had an unnecessary war since then, right? right? I call it the unknown war because no one knows anything about it. My favorite president, Harry Truman, was characteristically blunt. Of the War of 1812, Truman called it the silliest damn war we ever fought. And I think it was that too, I think it was that too. It was a war that had we won, Canada would have been a state. And possibly we would have had a huge slave colony in Mexico, maybe even Cuba. Had we lost the War of 1812, we would have become once again a colony of Britain. But after all that fighting, all that loss of lives, it was in the end a costly and complicated tie. It was a war that was fought from the Great Lakes down to the Gulf Coast. It was fought against the Canadians, the British, American Indians. It was fought off the coast of Brazil. It was fought in the Atlantic and Pacific. It was fought all the way to England and the Mediterranean. It was a continental-wide land war, and it was a worldwide naval and economic campaign. A fascinating, fascinating war. In the end, when the peace treaty was signed at Ghent, the reasons why we had the war were not even a part of the peace treaty. And some of the causes of the war were no longer apparent when we signed the declaration to go to war. Folks rather just wanted to rush for war. All right, so how did we get into the War of 1812? There are a lot of causes. For brevity, I'm going to list just three. Three main causes of the war. Number one, impressment. Anybody hear of impressment? Good, right, we used to teach history once upon a time in schools, right? Impressment. What this was, was the British would simply pull over, stop an American merchant ship, and they would press our sailors into service. They would just go on board and take sailors off and say, welcome to His Majesty's Royal Navy. Why did they do this? A couple of reasons. One of them was this. Britain was at war with Napoleon, and this was a continental-wide war in Europe. It was total war. Napoleon was hell-bent on dominating Europe and then some. It was total war to the point where if we traded with Napoleon or gave a French ship safe harbor, the British thought it was an act of war. Conversely, if we traded with the Brits and allowed a British ship to dock, the French saw it as an act of war. So it was total war. Now, while France possibly had the strongest army on land, easily Britain 
was the mistress of the seas, right? The British Navy was the master of the oceans. So here's one of the ideas that Britain had. Britain felt that one of the ways it could win the war was to blockade every port in Europe. Imagine how ambitious. And then blockade ports in the Caribbean and North America. Therefore, they would deny the French Navy the ability to resupply the army, the ability to move the army, men and weapons, the inability to export and therefore raise the money to fund the war, and the inability to import items, resources, which they needed to fight the war. So it would be equivalent to a stranglehold. So they launched this huge blockade. Now, if you have a massive blockade, you need a lot of ships. Britain wanted 1,000 ships in their navy. Could you imagine such a number? 1,000 ships. 1,000 ships means two things. One, Canada becomes very important. You need the wood for the ships, right? With all due respect, England is a relatively small, crowded, resource-poor island compared to Canada. Canada's endless forests could build 1,000 ships. So Canada becomes important, and Britain's going to fight for Canada. Secondly, if you have that many ships and you want to blockade that many ports, you need a lot of sailors. And there weren't enough sailors in His Majesty's Navy. One of the things the Brits did, there were a lot of enterprising tavern or pub owners. A lot of pub owners didn't just make their money from selling alcohol and, and, and uh, food. What they would do at the end of the night, and when they closed up shop, there would be six guys passed out drunk. They would load them in wagons, sell them to the British Navy. The guys would wake up the next day with a cold bucket of salt water in the face and someone standing over them saying, welcome to the Navy, right? Um, prison populations were sold and forced into. But even with that, Britain did not have enough sailors. So they stopped American merchant ships and took our sailors. New England fishermen, New England sailors were some of the best in the world. And therefore, that was an attractive prize for the British. Now, can you imagine American communities along the coast? Wives and widows and newspapers and politicians. When a ship comes back to port and says, the men were taken off, several men were taken off, they'll never be heard of again. They were taken by the British in an act of war. Americans wanted war. We were rightly angered, rightly upset. Moreover, another reason the British did this is so many British sailors would jump ship and join our Navy, our merchant fleet, or just be an American. Why? Life aboard a British warship, brutally hard discipline, long tours of duty, short life expectancies, not much pay. Or you could work for an American merchant ship, good pay, short tours of duty, lax conditions, and then take your money, pick up a shovel, and be a free American and own your own land. So a lot of Brits were jumping ship. One such incident happened in 1807, and we came this close to having the War of 1807. Here's what happened. Three Brits sailors jumped ship and came into the US from a British ship that was at port. And not only did they jump ship, but it appears that they stole the captain's rowboat to do that. So the captain wanted his boat and wanted his ship back. And rumor was that they went to work on board the ship, the USS Chesapeake. So the British ship is laying anchor, waiting for the Chesapeake to come out of harbor. And there's another British warship called the HMS Leopard. Perfect name, isn't it? Prowling the oceans, the Leopard. And this warship is waiting for our ship. When the Chesapeake comes out of port, its deck is filled with supplies and water and and its, its gun port doors are closed. If you wanted to fire a cannon, you had to raise the gun port doors, prime the cannon, roll it out, and then fire it. Gun port doors closed, decks strewn with supplies. It was headed all the way to the North African coast to fight the Barbary pirates, which we're still fighting pirates off the African coast, aren't we? 200 years later. Um, so the ship is sailing, the Chesapeake, and the leopard pulls up beside it. They say that they want to board the Chesapeake. And both commanders engage in a, an exchange with what then was called a trumpet. Today, we would call it a bullhorn. And the Americans say, we're not going to let you board. The British opened fire when we were at peace. They severely damaged the ship. They wound and kill many men on the ship. Then they board our ship and take